Okay, so 3.12 is saying find the momentum space wave function phi of p comma t for the free particle in terms of the function phi of k as introduced in equation 2.101. Then show that for the free particle, the magnitude squared of the momentum wave function is independent of time. So let's start right away just with the definition of the position wave, wave function for the free particle. So as defined in equation 2.101, this is going to give us psi of x comma t is equal to 1 divided by the square root of 2 pi multiplied by the integral from negative infinity to positive infinity of phi of k times e to the i times kx minus h bar k squared divided by 2m times t all divided all or not divided all multiplied by dk so if we want to find the momentum space wave function the first thing we're going to do is we're going to shove this into Plancharel's theorem do a Fourier transform so big phi of p comma t is going to equal 1 divided by the square root of 2 pi h bar times the integral from negative infinity to infinity of e to the negative i p x divided by h bar multiplied by the position space wave function psi of x comma t dx. So if we shove this in, this is going to give us, let's see, uh, 1 divided by the 2, the root 2 pi becomes just 2 pi. We still have the root h bar. And then we have an integral from negative infinity to positive infinity of e to the power of negative i p x divided by h bar multiplied by psi. And this integral is going to carry over. So this is going to give us the integral from negative infinity to infinity now of little phi of k multiplied by e to the power of i times k times x minus h bar k squared divided by 2m multiplied by t. And then we close this off dk and then we close the outer one dx. So integrals are commutative, right? So we can instantly, the first thing we're going to want to do is we're going to re rewrite this and basically pick and choose which integral we want to do first. So let's do that. This is going to equal 1 over 2 pi root h bar. And then a double integral, both from negative infinity to positive infinity. I'm going to split all my exponential terms out. So first off, I'm going to move my little phi to the left. Next, I'm going to define e to the negative i p x divided by h bar. And I'm going to split this exponential into two exponentials, e to the i k x times e to the negative h bar k squared divided by 2m times t dk dx. So the question now is, OK, do we integrate by k first or do we integrate by x first? And well, if we try to integrate by k, we have this mystery function, right, phi of k, and we don't know what that is. It, it's some arbitrary function. So we can't integrate that, so we might as well start by integrating x. Well, there's only two terms here that have x, right? This exponential and this exponential, these two. So let's consider what this integral equals. So an integral from negative infinity to infinity of e to the negative i p x divided by h bar times e to the i k x, all closed by dx. And then we can do this integral and then shove it back in there and then see where we can go from there. So uh, let's recombine this. This is going to give us integral from negative infinity to infinity of e to the negative i p x divided by h bar plus i k x. Then if I do a little bit of associative property, this is going to give me e. I'm going to factor out the i x and I'm going to reverse the order so that the positive is first. So there's going to be k minus p over h bar. And I basically, I've turned this into the form of something like ikx, effectively, where k is just an arbitrary constant that equals this term, right? So this is not a solvable integral, because remember, a complex exponential is just a sinusoid. And sinusoids are not integratable over infinity, because it goes up and down forever. It oscillates and never goes down to zero. So because of that, 
this term is just going to be undefined. But we can cheat a little bit. And this is sort of where I would say th this is one of those situations where you really start to see the difference between if you're a math major or if you're an applied science major. And what I mean by this is that in, you know, in physics and chemistry and a lot of physical sciences that you want, if you want to major in those, what you learn when you go deep enough is that math is sort of the tool to get the results you want, whereas in a math major, math is the whole point of it. So what you're going to realize is that when you're dealing with high level math in applied sciences, uh, a lot of the times you can sort of break the rules as long as it still works to some level. And what I mean by that is remember back in problem 2.26, one of the things that we said was that we can do sort of this illegal Fourier transform and equate a complex exponential of an infinite integral, uh, or sorry, an infinite integral of a complex exponential to our Dirac delta. We can, through a Fourier transform proof, we can say that Dirac delta of x is actually equal to one over two pi times the integral from negative infinity to infinity of e to the power of i k x dx. Now, this is not correct. It, it's not, and the reason why is because a Fourier transform requires an actual function. The problem here is that the Dirac delta is not a real function. It is a sort of a man-made construct that replicates a function, but it's not really a function, right? It sort of, it fails the rules mathematically that are required for something to be a function. So technically, you can't Fourier transform a Dirac delta. It's not, it's not a valid function to Fourier transform. But if you ignore those rules and you Fourier transform it anyway, it becomes a complex exponential. And we can technically just say, okay, uh, in this case, what if I just don't care that that's illegal? And what if I just did that anyway? And it turns out that if you do this, it is going to give you the correct answer. And the reason why is because the, although this breaks mathematical rules, it does not it does not result in any consequences that actually affect the physical nature of your system. And I'm going to show you exactly what I mean right now. So let's assume that this is just the correct option, right? Let's assume that I just I don't care that this is an illegal maneuver and I'm just going to do that anyway. Right. Actually, you know, what? even before that, let's let's say let's try to figure out why even that this is showing up. Right. Why? Why is it that when we try to do a Fourier transform of this problem of this system, why does it result in this sort of illegal integral? And the reason why is because we're missing this little fee of K, because remember back in the position space wave function, if you go back to that chapter that talked about it, the reason why this V of K is here is because it is a modulating term that effectively forces your complex exponential to go to zero at infinitely far away. And that forces normalization. And because of that, the resulting wave function is normalizable. It is valid mathematically. That V of K is not in this integral. And because of that, when you're switching from, you know, a position space wave function to a momentum space wave function, you're trying to integrate something that this, you know, these complex exponentials, which technically aren't integratable over infinite distances, you're trying to integrate them anyway, and you don't have this modulating function to help you. And because of that, you run into this awkwardness. Um, and sort of that's why this is happening. But, you know, as I've said earlier, let's assume that I don't care that this is not allowed, and I'm just going to do it anyway. I'm going to equate this integral to a Dirac delta function. Well, if we do that, right, then our integral is going to equal, uh, well, actually, let's write out exactly what this becomes first. So this is going to give us uh, 2 pi times the Dirac delta of k minus p over h bar. Right, where I'm going to just assume that the k over here is equivalent to the k here. So in that case, if I plug this back into my original integral, what is this going to give me? This is going to give me 1 over 2 pi times the square root of h bar. And now a single integral, negative infinity to positive infinity, of the Dirac delta of k minus p over h bar. And actually, you know what? The 2 pi at the front is going to cancel with the 2 pi down here. So I'm just going to get rid of it. 
uh, and then multiplied by our little phi of k, multiplied by our exponential e to the negative i, h bar k squared, all divided by 2m multiplied by t, and this is close by dk. And now, well, we can actually solve this, because remember, a Dirac delta inside of an integral is going to just pull whatever value that Dirac delta is based on out of the integral. Right, so if we do, if we solve this, you know, it's just going to pull out the value k equals p over h bar, and everything else is going to be zero. So this is just going to equal one divided by the square root of h bar, uh, multiplied by phi evaluated at k equals p over h bar. So phi of p over h bar, and then multiplied by e to the negative. Uh, we're going to plug in k equals p over h bar here. This is going to give us negative i p squared divided by 2 h bar m multiplied by t. And at this point, uh, let me just expand my canvas a little bit. Uh, let's make this height 10,000. So if this is equal to my momentum space wave function phi of p comma t, well, the probability density or the probability distribution mag phi of p comma t squared is going to give is going to give me one over h bar phi of p over h bar magnitude squared and then this complex exponential just goes to nothing this is exactly what we expected right this thing is time independent and griffith said oh you should expect that the momentum space wave function has a magnitude squared that is independent of time and that this sort of represents momentum conservation right so we've found that you know this is a valid solution it turns out it is the right solution but why why does the dirac delta technique work right why are we allowed to do this illegal dirac delta substitution technique and the reason why is because the physical implication of doing this dirac delta it it's allowed in our system in in fact it's required in our system right because what does a dirac delta do a dirac delta basically it forces k to equal one value. In this case, it forces our k to equal p over h bar, right? That's what this Dirac delta is doing. When, it, when we take this, it forces our k values to only equal p over h bar because the Dirac delta is going to equal zero for any other value where k isn't equal to p over h bar. What does this signify? k over k equals p over h bar. Well, h bar is a constant, so we don't care about h bar. What really matters here is it's, it's forcing k to be directly proportional to p k is proportional to p. Well, k is just our own way of rewriting the energy, right? k is directly proportional to the energy, whether it be like energy or energy squared or whatever, whatever our weird system makes, but k is related to energy. So by saying k is proportional to p, what we're really saying is that the energy is proportional to p, and p is the momentum. So what this is saying is that the energy of our system is bounded by momentum. So if momentum is larger, our system has more energy. If momentum is smaller, our system has less energy. I, that, I mean, that's just a normal physical system, right? Like think about, you know, just something like in a macro scale, think of a ball rolling down a hill, right? If this ball has more momentum, it has more energy. If it has less momentum, it has less energy. That's, I mean, that's obvious. This, doing this Dirac Delta substitution, even though mathematically speaking, it's illegal, the, the thing that it sort of the rule that it imposes onto our system is one that, you know, physically is allowed. And because of that, even though this is not a mathematically valid maneuver that we've just done, it does not affect the physics of our actual system. We are allowed to do it. And sort of if, if this feels very weird, um, I have one other example that sort of supports this idea of you know in in applied sciences sort of you you just bastardize the math however you want as long as it still works for your given physical system another very good example of where you encounter something like this is when you when you just start learning core uh, circuits when you just start learning circuits and you learn to sort of replace these cosine terms of current and voltage and whatever uh, when you just start learning how to replace them with complex exponentials because it turns out you know mathematically it's a lot easier to work with complex exponentials than cosines and sines 
So a lot of times in early, you know, in introductory, in introductory textbooks, when you're dealing with complex numbers for current and stuff, they'll say, okay, you know, th this current is defined as like a, an infinite sum of cosines and sines, right? And they'll say, okay, um, well, instead of doing that, let's just approximate this or not approximate this, but let's remodel this as a summation of complex exponentials. And what we'll do is we'll do all the math for complex exponentials because math with complex exponentials is just straight up easier than math with cosines and sines. And what you'll do is you'll you'll do the math with it and you'll pull out the real version. You'll, you'll pull out the real component of the complex exponential once you're done with your math and you just get rid of the imaginary component. Because, you know, cosine, there's no, if you have a current that's equal to like cosine of, you know, some, some constant at the front and x, right? There's no way that this equals e to the i k x, right? But you can say, okay, let's just turn this into cosine ax, and then I'm gonna add this fake term plus i sine ax, and I'm gonna turn this. You know, I'm gonna say this is then equivalent to you know a complex exponential e to the i kx or ax or whatever, right? And then I'm gonna do a bunch of math with this. And remember, the thing about complex numbers is that the real ver the real component and the imaginary component stay sort of independent from one another. So you can do a bunch of math and stuff with this exponential com complex exponential and you know once again it's easier than doing math with something like a cosine and once you sort of solve your problem you just convert this back into you know cosine plus i sine and you just get rid of the imaginary and that's just your physical answer this is the same concept the Dirac delta in order to be able to pull it out it basically imposes this, this condition that k becomes defined by whatever your Dirac delta is pulling out of in this case, p over h bar. Well, p is an arbitrary value determined by the momentum of the system. It still works, right? I can just assign whatever momentum I want. It's gonna, if I have more momentum, my energy has, my system has more energy. If I have less, my system has less energy. It, it's still allowed. So because of that, you take it, you sort of bastardize this math. You do this illegal maneuver with the Dirac delta through a Fourier transform, and it still works. So because of that, this technique is valid and we get our answer that way. And that's the end of 3.12.